Спасибо всем, кто пришел на доклад. Thank you. Я вам сейчас расскажу про fuzzing Linux kernel. Joining me at this presentation, I'll now go to talk about the fuzzing of the Linux kernel. I've been doing this for several years. I have got my own development done this area, and I've clicked a lot of other development, and I tried uh, to kind of generalize it and put things together. My name is Andrei Konovalov. I have been working with the Linux kernel for all my professional life after graduation. I've worked in different areas. I was building kernel bug detectors. I did fuzzers and also mitigations, memory tagging, that's um, mitigation for uh, memory corruption. Uh, while I was working with fuzzing, I had three major projects. Uh, first one, the first one uh, was about the fuzzing via syscalls. I found a few bugs and I wrote exploits for a few of those. Uh, then I had a large uh, project on uh, the third uh, party uh, network fuzzing. Imagine uh, you get a packet uh, to from uh, the uh, remote server uh, that triggers uh, memory corruption. So in in theory, you can execute uh, remotely, but uh, in actual experience, uh, there was only one exploit of this kind that's been found. And then I had uh, the USB fuzzing project. The idea is the same. You connect a USB device uh, to a Linux machine, and even though it looks uh, like a flash drive, but it's in fact is something different. In, for USB attacks, it will be a keyboard, and for some other more sophisticated attacks, it could be a device that will exploit the memory corruption in the kernel in some way. Uh, today I'll talk about fuzzing in the first place, uh, for those of you who don't know a clue about what is that, and then move to the kernel discussion. Uh, my uh, main part of my presentation uh, splits into three sections. It's all about the different ideas uh, that I needed to fuzz the kernel. I split it into three parts, depending on the complexity and evolution. Uh, then I'll have a Part. I will first present the ideas, and then I'll tell you, if you want to start fuzzing in the kernel tomorrow, what uh, you should start with, what approaches are available, and finally some tips and tricks. Uh, there's also a, a thing. I recently understood that in Russia, there's an organization responsible for the certification of the code in terms of security, and it appears they have a document uh, that describes how a document uh, should be certified against fuzzing, how they check it against fuzzing, and they uh, check uh, the uh, kernel distribution phases. So initially, the presentation was intended for those people who are working on uh, the same line as I do, but I think these people might also be interested. Firstly, what is fuzzing all about? Globally, fuzzing is a way to look for errors in code. How does it work? We generate arbitrary data, uh, pass it to uh, the software, and wait until it crashes and do it in cycle. So uh, we did some random inputs, we execute the program. If the, car, if the program has crashed, uh, if not, uh, we generate new code. If yes, uh, then it's great to find new one. So it's clear uh, that uh, the uh, program, uh, the software should be resilient to some wrong input. Let's take a parser and fuzz it. Uh, to fuzz XML, an XML parser, we need to have some random files. Uh, we put them into the parser. If the parser has crashed, uh, if not, uh, then uh, we generate a new one. If yes, then we found it. Uh, fuzzing is feeding uh, in random inputs until the program crashes. What kind of programs uh, can uh, we talk about? Applications, libraries, kernels, firmware. Well, that goes beyond uh, the scope of my today's presentation. Let's take a look at the definition of fuzzing in English. Every word is important here. Fuzzing is about feeding in a random input until the program crashes. In order to create a fuzzer, we need to find a response to each of these questions. For instance, so we have a problem. How do we execute it? If uh, it's just a user space uh, program, then we just run it. If it's firmware, uh, the 
needs to be some more sophisticated with that. Uh, what are inputs? How we deliver things into the program? Again, uh, in uh, the case of a symbol, for example, XML with parser, uh, we uh, just generate XML files. Uh, but if it's about a kernel, how to pass uh, the input to the right place? It's a separate question then. How to generate inputs? Uh, we can create some random data, random blobs uh, with random bytes, or we can do something smarter. Then, how do we detect bugs? If uh, the program has crashed, it must have been a bug. But there are certain bugs that uh, don't crash a program. A typical example is about information leak, for instance, uh, data leak from the kernel. And finally, how do we automate this process? We don't want uh, to manually create these inputs in the fuzzing process. We want it uh, to run automatically. Today, we're going to talk about the kernel. Uh, so I uh, replaced uh, the word uh, program. Uh, by the word kernel here. And so let's start addressing these questions. We'll start uh, with the simplest approach that was relevant eight to ten years ago and go through these questions one by one and see how uh, it can all be done. So we'll start uh, with how to start the kernel. Uh, obviously, there are two ideas here. We can run the kernel on uh, some hardware or in a VM because uh, the kernel is part of the operating system. It can be run in either places. Every one of these approaches has its pros and cons. Firstly, uh, regarding uh, which uh, parts of the kernel can be covered with fuzzing. Uh, in this uh, sense, hardware wins a bit uh, because hardware executes drivers, it has all the chips, and if you start uh, fuzzing the kernel, your end uh, purpose should be to find a bug in the real system. And the real life system is, in most cases, uh, hardware. Uh, the problem with the VMs is that if a VM emulates some device, then perhaps you can fuzz a driver for it. If it doesn't, it's impossible. Then, in terms of uh, management and automation, in this uh, respect, the VMs win uh, by a far mar by low margin uh, because uh, it's uh, clear to collect uh, the log for, for them. With devices, it's more difficult because uh, devices are difficult to reboot, uh, they can break. Uh, if you have, you know, used some wrong firmware uh, on the chip. And also, in case of devices, you need to find some serial ports, which may not be a trivial port. In terms of scalability, VMs also win, because it's enough uh, to take a more performance uh, piece of hardware and run more VMs. If it's about a device, it can be a unique device uh, that you can't, won't be able to lay your hands on uh, in more copies than one. So, uh, so we have these two opportunities, hardware, physical hardware and uh, VMs. Uh, let's try and figure out an approach that will work in both uh, places. Uh, let's now uh, find an answer to the second question. Uh, what's the what are the inputs? Uh, so it still makes sense here. The kernel uh, is uh, some uh, something between the user space and the hardware. So whatever we are uh, inputting uh, the kernel uh, system calls. So uh, the answer to uh, the second question is we're going to find syscalls. Then how are we going uh, to eject, inject uh, the syscalls to the kernel? So the kernel will be interpreting our syscalls. This is an obvious approach. It, it makes it, what makes it good, it runs on both hardware and uh, VMs. You just need to have binary code. Now, how are we going to generate the inputs? Let's step back and uh, consider the user space. How can we generate inputs uh, to the user space? Take a look at the XML file path. The first way is just to generate random data. The problem is that this way doesn't work very well. Imagine that our XML parser is expecting that the XML uh, file starts generating XML. And, uh, so this will take a lot of time, a lot of efforts if you do random checks. Simpler, sim, uh, similar 
checks uh, can uh, be run in other places of the file than most. Uh, probably uh, the person uh, will uh, conclude uh, that the file consists of XML tags. So this approach doesn't work very well. What can we do? It's obvious that we need to find a way to generate better inputs. How can we do that? There are several ways. Let's start uh, with the, sim uh, the simplest one. Uh, that's uh, structure of web fuzzing. In this case, we implement some grammar for the XML files. So an XML file is a sequence of XML tags. So instead of generating uh, random uh, bytes, we're going to generate random tags as part of our grammar. And the grammar uh, can include the requirement that the valid uh, file starts with an XML tag. Let's uh, apply this idea to the kernel. We need to understand how inputs are for the kernel, what the inputs for the kernel look like. Look, uh, we can generate some structured data, but the problem is that SQL accepts it called with arguments. It's not just a sequence of bytes. So it's a typical example of input for the kernel. It looks like this. We use uh, the we open syscall to open the device file, then we use uh, the IOC syscalls and then close. Uh, what do we see here? If we uh, take a closer look, it's a sequence of calls. Uh, there are structured arguments there. In the open syscall, the first argument is a string, is a very simple structure with the only fixed field. In the ioctal syscall, the third argument uh, is a uh, more sophisticated structure with uh, several fields. And finally, there's an unusual thing uh, that some syscalls can return values, and these values can be reused in other syscalls. It all looks at, as a very similar to an API of some library. When we're fuzzing a kernel, in a certain sense, so we're fuzzing uh, the API that offers us access to the kernel. And this whole idea of fuzzing the kernel is uh, what I call API-aware fuzzing. So how does it work? Our fuzzer must know what kind of calls are available in this API and what arguments are used there. And we need to generate our inputs correspondingly. In the case of the kernel, unfortunately, there's no standard description of all the possible APIs that this kernel uh, provides, all the possible syscalls and arguments. There are several uh, attempts, several attempts have been, been made how it can be done, could be done automatically, but none None of these attempts has been successful. So the only uh, thing left uh, to do is to write these descriptions by hand. And finally, our fuzzer uh, should be able to return uh, the values from this call. If uh, this call has returned the file descriptor, we need to be reusing. We need to reuse, to be able to reuse this uh, descriptor. The easiest way is to, uh, to create a list of file descriptors, and we know that any time uh, the syscall returns a descriptor, we add it to the list every time uh, we uh, are getting a such uh, request, uh, we reuse it. So the idea is very simple. We fuzz uh, the API. So let's uh, use uh, some simplest possible way uh, to implement this API fuzzing, as shown previously. So how are we going to detect, to detect the bugs? Uh, the dumbest way is to monitor the kernel log and see uh, if there's panic there. Panic is when the kernel is crashing. So automation, the simplest approach, no automation. We uh, run uh, the syscalls uh, in a cycle and grab manually. So this is the simplest approach to fuzzing. And if you are a person, if you ask a uh, fuzzer, uh, uh, what kind of fuzzing does that? They'll say it's Trinity. Trinity was written a long time ago. Works perfectly. Uh, it's not uh, being used very uh, frequently today because there are better things. But what makes it good is that uh, it has knowledge of a lot of different uh, 
Cisco's and you just send binaries there and swarming with random arguments. So that was the simplest approach. Uh, let's make our approach more sophisticated, coming to the next part. Uh, we'll uh, leave the answers uh, to the first three questions uh, the same as previously. Uh, so we use either VMs or uh, hardware, uh, the inputs are zip codes, and we use uh, binaries. So there's no problem about that. It's quite natural. How do we generate inputs? Uh, let's uh, think of a, a better way to generate inputs uh, rather than uh, sending random uh, values. So the second idea is called coverage-guided fuzzing. It's a fuzzing uh, based uh, on uh, the uh, code coverage information. How does it work? We also generate random inputs, but sometimes uh, we don't generate uh, it randomly. Sometimes uh, we uh, get uh, the inputs that are of interest to us. If we take uh, the next uh, interesting input, we mute it. Uh, we uh, can flip a bit, a byte, add something. We uh, make something uh, to, we do something uh, to make this uh, module a little bit different from what we've already had. Then we run the program and see if a new coverage has appeared. So the global idea is, we want that uh, the software should execute something new, something interesting. And uh, the level of interest uh, is defined through coverage. Has the program uh, used some new instructions or new code lines? Uh, if not, uh, then uh, perhaps uh, the newly generated code has not brought us anything new. And we throw it uh, away. If uh, it has uh, brought us something new, it means that it's interesting, and we add it uh, to, the, uh, to the body uh, of interesting inputs, and we do it uh, to infinity, uh, trying to get deeper and deeper into the code of the program. Also, when we uh, mutate, we can combine the coverage-guided approach uh, to the one uh, that uh, we discussed earlier, the structured one. If uh, we can mutate a structure, we can mutate it not randomly, uh, but uh, through uh, using certain logic, for instance, adding uh, or removing some field or an array. Uh, let's try and apply it uh, to the kernel. It's very important here uh, that in the coverage-guided approach, as opposed to what we've used before, uh, we uh, need to understand uh, we need to cover a, a single test case. So as a separate case, so we can take a single syscall, but it works. It doesn't work very well because some syscalls uh, create resources and others use them. We want our test cases to be isolated so that they should work stand alone. So the idea is that as a test case, uh, we don't take a single syscall, uh, but a sequence of syscalls. And finally, in order that we could do coverage, fuzzing, we need a way to create the coverage. So just understand, if the new run uh, has uh, discovered something new in the kernel, there's this uh, KCOV uh, tool uh, that is quite relevant, it's based on compiler instrumentation, the collects coverage are from the current task context. Uh, so, it's important to notice here, to mention here, that the coverage should be relevant for our current executable input, because there are a lot of processes in the kernel that work in the background, and we don't want to collect coverage from there, because imagine, uh, we've run input uh, once, and an interrupt hasn't come back, and then uh, we did it again, and uh, some weird, some dodgy interrupt has come back. If our father, uh, works based on the interrupts, uh, it can uh, derive, derive uh, that something new happened, uh, but it has nothing to do uh, with the interrupt. So, so as an answer to the question of where are we going to use 
Теперь вопрос, как мы детектим баги. So the question, how do we detect bugs? Let's think of something better than panics. Panics uh, work uh, poorly as, a, uh, as an indicator. Firstly, because some bugs don't generate uh, panic, and secondly, especially in the memory corruption ca uh, cases, uh, the panic may not happen at the same time uh, as the corruption happened. Imagine there's a double free situation. It happens in one place, and then uh, no bad things are going to happen until uh, this buffer uh, has been uh, required by something else. So we need to find a way, uh, find a way to fight these to detect such cases, to report them to us. Everything is similar here. Uh, dynamic bug detectors have been built for the kernel. Dynamic means that they run uh, in the execution during execution, and that makes them great fit. Uh, for the uh, kernel, there are several such dynamic detectors. Uh, the most notable of them is Kaysan, and uh, it's most notable not because I uh, did some work on it, but, but uh, because it detects memory corruptions. So it also use a compiler uh, tooling. We just need to enable certain config in the kernel, and the case and will just run. Each time uh, it discovers some uh, memory corruption, it will report it. There are also a lot of detectors. Several have been mentioned here. All of them are called sanitizers by the analogy with Unispace sanitizer. For those who write in C++, sanitizers are basically programs uh, to look uh, for bugs. So this is an implementation of these sanitizers uh, for the kernel, this sanitizer uh, for behavior, the came san to look uh, for uninitialized uh, namely uh, cases and for data races. Uh, we are going to have a presentation from Dimitri Avyukov here at this conference, uh, who will talk about dynamic tools to look for bugs in the kernel. Uh, an important note, there are a lot of articles in the, in the internet saying this. Uh, the is a fuzzer that's a bit cooler than Trinity. So they always say these dynamic detectors, like the SAN, are an integral part of Syscola. It's absolutely wrong. All these detectors uh, can be used separately from the fuzzing processes. For instance, you can run uh, kernel tests uh, with these detectors just to check that these tests don't um, initiate any problems. You can do it and you can stream them as a approach. As, as I described earlier, but that was a digression. So what are we going to do uh, for bug uh, detection? Uh, we'll take a step. Now, how do we automate? What can we do for the automation is exclusively up to our fantasy, what we can think of. Of course, we don't want uh, to manually grab uh, the uh, uh, log, uh, crash logs, especially if we have a lot of VMs, we don't want to do it manually on each VM. If a VM has crashed during fuzzing, we want to restart. If uh, there are a lot of crashes that are similar, we want to group them, cluster them, uh, to make it easier to debug them. If uh, also, another interesting idea, uh, you can generate reproducers, so reproducing the crashes that happened if in the fuzzing process we're generating a lot of different inputs and some of them triggered a memory corruption, uh, we can try and restart them all to understand uh, which uh, particular of them uh, did that. So we can generate a test case uh, that leads to memory corruption. And we can do a lot of things. You can uh, report bugs uh, to developers. The only question is how to do that. There's nothing super um, natural here. So the approach uh, that we use, the new approach that we use. So we left the first question as they were. We're using either VMs or physical hardware. We fire syscalls. Uh, we use APIs and coverage guides based on kickoff and KSAN as detector, as automation, everything that I already mentioned in the previous slide. Now, if you ask a person who is watching a kernel, what fuzzer uh, has a, have I written? Uh, they'll say it's a syscall. This is uh, 
base configuration. Syscola is one of the advanced uh, fuzzers now. Uh, a lot of effort has been invested in developing it, and okay. it's known to everybody in this business. Let's now move to the next part. Let's try and uh, make this whole thing in a more complicated. Some of the ideas that are listed here are already implemented, and some have not uh, yet uh, been fully formed as an idea in my head. So I decided to report them to you. Maybe somebody uh, will do that earlier. I'm not going to uh, split into sections just like I did in the previous section. We clearly understand there are six questions that we need to provide answers to. So OK, let's start it. Let's start from where the code can be run. We started uh, with uh, the assumptions that the code can run on the VMs and uh, hardware. But there's a, a, th a third approach. You can do it in the user space. We can take uh, such a system and try to compile it as a user space library. This uh, may turn out to be quite difficult because this uh, subsystem can use the APIs that are available. It's the same. The same RC, read, copy, update. Uh, uh, does mean uh, that not important. One of the subsystems in Linux. If uh, it's a subsystem uh, that allocates memory, uh, can lock, or we can replace can lock by lock and can free and by free and do it in user space. Uh, there's a disadvantage of uh, uh, us being able to use all our previous ideas that we used in uh, the user space. But the minus is that when uh, the part uh, that we're extracting has updated, it's very difficult to reproduce. It's difficult to automate that. There are several examples uh, where people did that. The first two examples are about the Linux kernel. They're quite simple. And the third example is about the XNO kernel. It's the uh, Apple uh, kernel for uh, iPhones and uh, MacBooks. The idea is the same. I, by the way, recommend uh, this article uh, by uh, Williams. Uh, now, about the inputs. Up until now, we've been discussing uh, kernel inputs and syscalls, but uh, because the input, input is a lay between the hardware and the uh, user space, it has inputs uh, from the hardware side. We can fuzz uh, these inputs as well. We can fuzz from the network, from USB. We can even fuzz some uh, other protocols, Bluetooth, NFC, mobile protocols. It all goes through the hardware, and sooner or later gets in the kernel. For instance, you've sent a TCP packet uh, to the system, so obviously uh, the kernel should be able to pass it, understand which port it has been uh, addressed uh, to and uh, deliver it. Uh, here, another question becomes uh, very relevant. How do we deliver uh, these inputs? Uh, the Cisco was executed as a binary, but if we want to deliver a USB packet or USB device, it can be quite difficult. There are uh, two approaches here that I've seen being used. Firstly, in some uh, sophisticated way, it can be done uh, from the user space. Perhaps you also need to write your own driver or reuse uh, a ready-made one uh, that will just uh, hook uh, to the required part of the kernel and inject the packet, or using uh, do it uh, through the VM, through a hypervisor. So the VM uh, can emulate a situation uh, where a packet has arrived with the user space. Uh, so these are the two approaches that use I fast the network with DevTun. Uh, this uh, interface is used in VPN clients. It can be set up in a specific way. So that any data that you write into this file will uh, pass uh, through the same paths or passing paths in the kernel as the data that have arrived from the outside. This way you can fast the net. USB, there are similar things in order to do it uh, via USB. Uh, as to the hypervisor and VM, I saw this approach. Uh, guys uh, use uh, QMO and a special protocol that allow injecting a USB a device inside a system that we're fuzzing. Then, there are even more exciting thi things if we're fuzzing syscalls. Some syscalls are not APIs. So uh, open, I hope will close are APIs, but the other syscalls that work differently. Uh, let's start uh, with two uh, syscalls, clone and sig action. Uh, they work similarly. They also accept arguments. They can return some result, but they also generate a second uh, execution process. The clone uh, 
creates a real process. As you can, uh, you can add a, a processor for some other signal. So if you want uh, to add these syscalls, the reasonable idea is that you need to pass uh, from the side uh, that uh, they are calling and uh, the one uh, that they generate from the handload of the process. So you you can also write a custom file. Yeah. And finally, there are also a number of syscalls, BPF, KV, oh, it's, these are not exactly syscalls, subsystems. What makes them different is, as opposed to simple structures, they accept uh, strings of instructions and generating a uh, correct set of instructions is an absolute different task. I don't have a formal uh, explanation of this process, but this comes from my intuition to generate a sequence of instructions that's not uh, going to crash. Uh, on the second instruction by uh, through uh, for instance, division by zero is quite difficult. So for fuzzing of such system, uh, you need to use something else. Now, about uh, the external input structure, imagine uh, that you are fuzzing network packets. It may, uh, you may think uh, that packet uh, fuzzing is also about uh, fuzzing structures and sending structures, but actually the network works like an API from the outside. An example, if we're fuzzing a TCP, imagine uh, that the host, there's a socket that's listening, and we want to connect to this uh, socket from the outside. It works like this. Uh, we send a SIM, uh, uh, the host sends ACK, we can send SYNAC, and the connection is established. But when uh, we get this uh, ACK, this ACK has a magic number that we need to embed into the next packet, CDNAC. So, in a certain way, it's about returning a value uh, from uh, the kernel, uh, but uh, from the external uh, from, from the external side. An example of this is in ACK, ACP uh, TCP UDP protocol, well known, was SCTP, something like that, but very specific. And there are a lot of other things uh, that I've encountered when I was working on this. Finally, when we're fuzzing USB, it's also something strange. USB is really a very strange protocol. Uh, 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 everything is not ge is generated not by the host, so we want to fuzz years. We can't just send data for the host. We need to wait for a request from the host, and we can only uh, reply to this request and to, to this uh, request. And we don't know what the next request is going to be. So USB fuzzing is quite a specific thing uh, that uh, you need to approach differently. Uh, let's move to the next part. Uh, how do we collect coverage other than using KCOM? I mentioned several things here. Firstly, you can use emulators, uh, VMs. Imagine uh, your VM uh, is emulating the kernel uh, by instruction, and you can just uh, hook uh, up uh, to this uh, process and start collecting instructions. Uh, these approaches do exist, and uh, what makes uh, them very useful is that uh, they don't need source code uh, as opposed to KCOM. And there are also approaches uh, through using hardware tracing features such as KFOM. None of these approaches, well, basically, these are all research papers, and uh, they don't fit uh, very well. Uh, any engineering use in real-life situations. In addition uh, to us uh, wanting to collect coverage from the code, we want uh, to collect coverage that would be relevant for our code. As I said, uh, we're not passing this code. We want to collect coverage from this code. But unfortunately, but by default, uh, if we're just uh, collecting coverage from this thread, it may not work. For instance, uh, if our Cisco is run, well, is, the, is processing data in some other context than its own, imagine that the Cisco processor uh, creates a track, a uh, thread, and passes data for processing to this thread. So then, if you want to see new coverage with a new input, you need to collect coverage not only from the thread that uh, Cisco is executing, but from all the threads that it's uh, creating. Uh, another example uh, uh, with USB fuzzing. Some USB uh, packets are processed in global threads that are not connected, not linked to the user space, and you want to get coverage on them. For KCOB, as a result, I uh, built a thing that allows annotating a specific uh, parts of the code as a critical section with the uh, kernel to, as I say, that I want to get coverage from them to use, it, to use fuzzing there. Or maybe some other approach uh, can also be invented. Uh, also, we can collect uh, other types of signals. 
Uh, actually, what we want, ideally, we want to be able to find bugs. One of the ways is to get deeper and deeper into this uh, program, covering more and more codes, uh, expecting that uh, this will help us to get more errors. But the second idea is not just to go deeper into the code, but we can make uh, the uh, status in, in the kernel very difficult. So usually, uh, the premise is that if we uh, put uh, the kernel into a very difficult uh, status, it won't cope. So uh, this is what we do. Uh, we can track uh, the memory object status. And finally, the thread, uh, the third approach. Is generate better inputs is to collect uh, the body of inputs uh, that exist in real programs. Uh, so in uh, the case of the kernel, we need to take a look at real programs and uh, start uh, seeing uh, what they do. Uh, if uh, we look uh, around them and mutating something uh, in them, uh, then we can find something interesting. I've seen uh, this approach uh, in the moonshine research process. Uh, they don't progress with the stasis, they collect uh, the log uh, and try to modify it. Another exciting approach. So the problem actually is uh, that it's very difficult uh, to use this approach for the kernel. Yeah, if uh, for some passes in the US space, it's uh, uh, easy uh, to take a lot of cases, but uh, for the kernel, it is not. Finally, how can you detect more bugs? I have already mentioned dynamic bug detectors, but uh, you may not uh, just take them as uh, they are, but uh, do something with them. For instance, you can take a SAN, the thing that finds uh, memory corruptions, and add some new locator. So CASAN, by default, uh, can process standard kernel uh, things based on JLog and others. But if you have a driver, quite often there are drivers for Android devices that allocate a big uh, area of memory and split into chunks. So KSAN, in this case, will not be able to find an overflow from one chunk to another. Uh, you need to add annotation, and this is a reference to how you can uh, add uh, annotations to mempool. It's an allocator that's built on top of another allocating kernel, and you can look up what's been done in this area. And finally, for KMSAN, you can add checks uh, to look for info leaks. Uh, by default, uh, KMSAN uh, looks uh, for inf inf information leaks in the user space, uh, but if uh, we also want, if we are connected to the network, who would like to see, to find those leakages in the network, uh, similar for USB. And one other idea is uh, that you can build your own detectors, such uh, you can figure out how the existing ones run and do something similar, or maybe do something very elementary, such as add asserts uh, everywhere. For instance, if we we know that some conditions should not happen, uh, we add back on the Pfizer and uh, see if this logical error has not happened. So it's especially interesting in the VPF uh, context, and uh, it was discussed in the previous uh, presentation, uh, VPF uh, will most likely not trigger any uh, memory corruption. It can be quite a random error. I don't want to uh, go too deep there because VPF is a very complicated subject, but uh, you, you can think of something new and very exciting there. All right, this was the list of ideas that can be used for fuzzing. Let's now move to the approaches. Imagine that after the conference you returned back home and decided to fuzz something. So what do you start? What approaches are there? What uh, can be used. I've listed quite a lot of tools. Which one of them to take? I'll describe three approaches that I saw people successfully use recently. So, how do we just take the uh, user space fuzzer and reuse it? We take a simple one like AFL or LibFuzzer, and they are well designed to uh, fuss the uh, user space uh, application. So let's repurpose it for fuzzing the, uh, the core code. 
It oh, we can для... just take the core so code in the user space and parse it there. So this works quite well for the system calls and, um, because uh, they are uh, well, uh, well made for the space. And uh, we can uh, send uh, the uh, signal to uh, uh, to, to get the uh, blob-like inputs. And if we have different kind of inputs, then we'll need uh, some custom generators or mutators, so you will need to reprogram the father, but you can reuse something from the already existing one. And of course, if we need to uh, implement the coverage-guided approach, then we need to be able to take it uh, from the core and uh, put it into the Pfizer. So this is a complicated approach that's uh, still being used. I mentioned and Ned's article on uh, how he used it for the Apple Corp. And another approach would be ta to take the syscaller. It's a straightforward thing, but it's not very easy to configure to configure it in the correct way. How you use the syscaller is not the topic of my presentation. There's a lot of other presentations, and I think I would recommend you to just look through a number of them to, to get the full picture. It's great for uh, fuzzing the API, and instead of hard coding the API descriptions into the syscaller, it's uh, written on Go. There's a syslang to write those descriptions. There, you can define the structure, the unions, and uh, everything you need. So a couple of advice. If you use the syscaller, don't launch it on the standard core uh, with the standard config. You won't find anything. There's a lot of people doing this. And, uh, most probably you will not be able to, to get anything, uh, anything new. Um, so this is quite useless. Um, create a new rule, a new description. Do something unique. Maybe you could fuzz some uh, non-standard syscalls or using non-standard configs or distributions. Um, also, the syscaller is uh, not a fuzzer. It's an extendable thing that uh, you can uh, mm, modify. So when I was, uh, uh, for example, analyzing the USB uh, case, and then I uh, added some parts to the fuzzer to use it for USB. And it can also be used as a framework. So you don't launch the binary, you just take the part of code that parses the uh, core log. It can recognize a hundred of different errors that can happen within the core, and you can just reuse that code. The third and the final approach would be to create your own fuzzer from the ground up without using anything. It gives you an opportunity to understand very well how this all works. And with this approach, you can target very specific subsystems. So let me give you three links here. They are very, very cool. If you open only those, only three links from my presentation, those are the links. First one is uh, Brandon Falk uh, with his article of uh, let's create the dumbest ever in the world um, Android core fuzzer. And the idea is that we just take an Android phone, uh, we look at the slash dev list of devices, we open them, uh, close them, and write to them. This crashes Android phones. The second one is about uh, uh, BPF fuzzing, because BPF is fuzzed both in the user space and in the core. First, you need to fuzz it and to pass through the validator, and then you need to um, 
to check whether this application triggers some bug. And the third approach would be to use the core fuzzing from the very opposite uh, side to fuzz not only from the syscalls, but uh, you, you would uh, not, you, you would need to fuzz the x86 instructions uh, on the syscall level. That's a quite interesting thing. And I'm, I'm, I'm nearing the, the end of the presentation. Some simple things. How do you check that your father works well? The first option is to just check the coverage. The hint is very simple. Just check that your father actually reaches the needed functions. Second, can you add a wrong, a fake bug into the system that you are being fuzzed. So you just add a couple of asserts and uh, check that the fuzzer reaches that part of the code. So it's similar to coverage checking, but uh, it's easier to, to check because uh, if, if your fuzzer does not support the code coverage function, then you can just add. Um, read the code and uh, write your fuzzer based on the code, not, not based on the documentation. Uh, writing code based on the documentation does not work very well. I saw this a couple of times, and uh, when I was actually creating a USB fuzzer, I, was, I rejected uh, the idea of reading the standard and just uh, went to reading the code. Whether the fuzzer should be fast or smart. Um, fast means that it runs fast, and uh, smart means having extra functions. So my idea is for the fuzzer to be smart. Uh, the, the fast is the second priority. I don't know why, it's my experience, but there is an article here and the link to an article where they discuss the similar idea. And the final thing in my presentation is the next one, um, is the following. It's a programmer's work. And to create fuzzers, you need programming skills. So you need to be able to design the system, you need to be able to write code, to test it, to check that your fuzzer is working, that the system is being covered. And this leads me to two conclusions. First, to create even a very simple fuzzer, the, the only thing you need is just to be able to program. Creating a program in Python or any other language that creates random inputs and uh, gets the responses is very simple. But to create a good fuzzer, you really, really need good engineering skills. So this is why Syscaller is better than our, uh, most other fuzzers, because a lot of engineering time and engineering talent was uh, put into cre the creation of that one. And there's a lot of links uh, to different articles about the core in itself, and different fuzzers, and the uh, Telegram channel with the uh, interesting links and facts about the core, uh, they will all be available on the PhD site. And I invite you to have a look what uh, what is there, what is interesting. So thank you. Thank you very much for your attention and being here. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask them. Just wait for the mic to come. Thank you. The question uh, is about the subsystems that you, um, you are fuzzing. What uh, coverage did you reach? And the follow-up is if you um, talk about the uh, industry scale, enterprise scale, do you use the farm uh, or you use v VMs? 
Uh, okay, so first question, the coverage. If you want percentage, it's very slow because this, this system has a lot of code and a lot of code cannot be used, cannot be reached from the user space. It works in the background asynchronously. It has nothing to do with the input. And uh, so if you measure percentage, then it will be very small. If you try to limit the code to only the code that it, you think is relevant, say I'm usually finding a number of files that process the input that uh, I'm interested in. Uh, for example, if I was parsing the human interface devices, then I was only looking at the uh, coverage for the file that is responsible for, for this input. So I was able to reach 90% there easily. This is uh, a very complicated question. Uh, you need, it's very hard to understand uh, which code in the core is relevant to specific function. So to measure the successfulness of your fuzzing is uh, uh, yeah, difficult. One. And the second question, I just uh, used a huge machine. Um, I don't remember, like 100 cores, uh, a machine that was given, engineering machine that was uh, given by, uh, to me and to all the developers by, by my company. And uh, I just ran it in the background. And the system that is called SysBot, that is automating fuzzing on top of SysColor, uh, they usually use Google data centers and uh, host it in the cloud. So if you, my thinking is that if you focus on a specific subsystem, you don't need a super machine to run it because you need to use your fuzzer to be fast. And whether it finds the bug uh, within an hour or a day, doesn't really mean much. Uh, we have questions over there. Thank you for the presentation, Andre. And uh, if we talk about syscaller and uh, the network fuzzing using syscaller, you, you said there's network interactions, and uh, you need to understand. Do you mean external or syscall wise? I mean DevTune. You need to understand the context of, of where you are in terms of a network interaction. What does uh, what is currently Syscaller capable of in that context? Answer. Well, the idea here is that you've, you, you've asked a very good question about the level of interaction. We wanted to create sockets and uh, access those sockets externally and send some data there. So as within an application, the socket is created when the application is launched and is killed after the application is terminated, then uh, you don't store the state, right? And uh, the fuzzing does not uh, save the state. And uh, some cases can be lost, so we did not create any insulation for those uh, edge cases. How capable is the syscaller in terms of understanding uh, that, for example, currently we are working with the uh, connection setup? Yeah, for those who understand how syslang is uh, built, this is all uh, built on resources, and there's a resource called unconnected socket. So let me give you a separate uh, lecture and show the code. But when the socket changes state, you, you use different resource. And you also had question about how scalable it is. There's a lot of things you can add. Yeah, that's true, because I've added the uh, IPv4, TCP, UDP. Uh, you have uh, IPv6 uh, that is not very well covered. So syscaller here can be um, really heavily modified. OK, and another question. Fuzzing is a great tool. You can uh, not only search for the bugs, but it's useful in the, run in, 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 uh, in the operations. So can, how can I use it? For example, I don't know the core APIs. Uh, I don't know the core API. Uh, can I use fuzzing to understand what is uh, what, what is uh, what are my threats? What are my vectors through the API? Well, it's a good question. Uh, my thinking was that you describe all the APIs manually, but it's a valid valid scenario. For example, you have systems with one syscall, 
but they are very complex internally. And if you don't know what's there, what's inside, then you can fuzz it. And uh, uh, for example, with Netlink, you have uh, if you send a message to Netlink, then uh, you have endless amount of uh, listeners uh, that uh, can reply to your message. But it's a good idea. I don't know. I don't know the, uh, of, the, of any formal technique. And if we approach fuzzing in a formal way, then yeah, we need an approach to analyze and uh, somehow enumerate all the possible inputs into the system or entrances into the systems. But I never used fuzzing for, for such cases. Thanks. Thank you. Good question. Thanks for the presentation, Andrew. Did you run fuzzing on something like Minix? No, the Syscaller supports a number of different cores, but if I'm not mistaken, Minix is not one of them. Yeah, I understand, but no, it was never... I think I never even <laughs> touched or uh, looked at Minix in any context. How difficult is hardware fuzz? Well, I think it's, it's complex and uh, when we fuzz the USB. Do you mean uh, hardware fuzzing in, in, in general? A good question, but I actually never, never done it. Uh, Andrew, how do you uh, fuzz integer overflow? Well, the easiest way would be to uh, try to use the undefined behavior sanitizer that in some configurations can find integer overflows if it happened. And how do you provoke uh, integer overflow to happen uh, is a good question that I don't know the answer to. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my first question is quite standard. What is the most interesting bug that uh, you found using the syscaller? I think the most interesting bug that I found when I was um, fuzzing the uh, system from the outside, the idea was to find their CE and uh, not on the public core but on the uh, custom protocols within my company. Uh, yes, I found an RCE. Uh, will not say anything specific. And the bug was quite significant and uh, an important protection system was not activated. That led to this bug being exploitable. But you would need to know the offsets and know which core is launched and uh, create a chain out of all the gadgets. But if you exploit the core from the outside, you need an infolic, you need some how to somehow get the information for uh, for this core. And the second question is about the work that you do together with the core developers. How fast are they in, in terms of fixing the bugs that Syscaller and Sysbot finds? It depends on the subsystem and specific developers. I started working with the network part, and uh, when one of the maintainers uh, was receiving the bugs, uh, it took him just days to fix. We had great collaboration, and then uh, we uh, the sysbot appeared. This all started to, to to be fuzzed automatically, and then depending on the developer, it. Uh, actually it would be very different. So I worked with the network guys uh, I liked it a lot and with the sound guys and the maintainer for the sound subsystem uh, he's fixing like everything within hours. But the experience is quite different. People argue sometimes uh, saying that like why do you send me this, this garbage and uh, for the core developers you know a warning is uh, not a correct thing but in terms of fuzzing if you uh, 
uh, if you trigger a warning, then it, uh, it's not very good for the fuzzing. Because when you met your first bug uh, as part of the, of the fuzzing, you need to just kill the core and uh, restart, restart it, because then the state changes. And the other bugs can be the consequence of the first bug. So you need to, to, to actually report it to the developer. Thank you for the presentation. In terms of user space uh, fuzzing, you uh, have uh, user mode support and uh, you can test based on this architecture. And uh, if I remember correctly, uh, Android uh, uses the user mode architecture. So did you try to look uh, in that direction? And also we have uh, Linux kernel library with the same kind of aim and uh, the question is uh, they, they're trying to find the file system box using the LKL. Did you try to look at those projects uh, for the syscaller? Uh, actually, I, I know people are trying to do this, but I did not look there, and uh, I think I cannot specify anything here. Uh, we are out of time, so if you have some further questions, please feel free to come out together with me and ask some questions. We have our next presentation starting. Thank